Thank you all for joining us. My name is April LeVarrier, Digital Marketing Specialist with Kepware. Duane Bacharach, uh, Kepware Senior Applications Engineer, will host our presentation today. In today's webinar, Joanne will discuss some best practices when using Kep Server EX version 5. There will also be an opportunity for Q&A at the conclusion of the webinar. If at any time during the presentation you have a question, please raise your hand or type directly into the questions pane using your GoToWebinar control panel, and we will respond as efficiently as possible. I will now turn the presentation over to Joanne. Hi everybody, thanks for joining. I'll, uh, I had a poll up here when you join the webinar. I'll share those results just showing a distribution of where you're from. Uh, so it looks like we've got majority in North America, but we've got some Europe, AP, South America, some other places as well. So thanks so much uh, for giving us your time today. Okay, hide that poll and you should be seeing my screen now. Hopefully you all are. If you're not, um, I do have people on the line here to assist me um, and answer your questions and help you out if you have any issues. Um, with me is uh, Robert Sharp from Technical Support, um, as well as Senior Applications Engineer Sam Elzer, and two other Applications Engineers, Kylie Corgan and Ray Lavi. So we have quite a full force um, to support you today. We have a very large audience. Um, so again, thanks for joining. Okay, so we're going to go over uh, best practices today. I'm taking a beginner's approach. We're going uh, beginning at the installation. If you're in, uh, in the scenario where you're installing this for the first, first time through configuration channel device tag all the way through some of our diagnostic tools and the workings behind the server. Um, since it is kind of a beginner's approach, it may be a little basic or a review for people who are experts on the line. Uh, but just FYI, we, will, uh, we do have uh, resources available if you do want to kind of deep dive into any of these subjects. Uh, we have our YouTube channel. That's where the recording will be posted um, after this webinar. Um, on our YouTube, we have the webinar section. And you can actually see, for example, Sam Elsner has been doing a Beyond Device Communication series. And he just did uh, utilizing databases with Cap Server X. And he also did uh, OPC UA at the beginning of this year. So you can access that content on our YouTube page right now. Um, and that's where this content will be posted when we're done here today. I also want to point out that uh, we have Portland training classes. Uh, our last one for this year is in November. So you can go on this form and uh, fill out a training request form if you want to come to Portland. We'll have our 2015 schedule posted soon. And we definitely deep dive into all the topics that we, we're going to go over today in that class. We also do on-site classes if you want to Bring us on site, um, have us train a group of people um, at your facility. Uh, you can register for that through this training class form. And then last but not least, uh, we just got this and launched this LinkedIn uh, page that you can access through um, Kepware's LinkedIn pages, kepware-product-training. And we post information about our upcoming webinars, information about um, helpful blog posts and videos and things that we're doing. And um, that, you can follow us, get notifications, and that was just launched. So definitely follow us if you're looking for those sorts of updates. OK, wonderful. Well, let us begin with the content here. So the first thing you're going to do is download CapServer X. And the way you do that is you can go through the web portal here or get it through um, your local distributor. If you're going through the web portal, you um, haven't created a login, you'll need to sign up. I already have a login, so I'm already logged in here, and I would just download um, the current version, which is uh, 5.15, which we'll be using today. So we'll pretend we've downloaded that, and here's uh, the executable. I'm going to go ahead and just launch that. So the first thing I want to note uh, on the install is I'm going to click next through a lot of these windows, but I don't want to just click next all the way through. Uh, I'm going to stop at this select features window. If you click through this and just start the install, you're only going to install our simulator driver. So it's important that you stop at this page and think about what you want to install. So for example, if I expand communication drivers here, and maybe I want to install, you know, my Allen Bradley suite. So I select entire feature, and you see how it goes from a red X to white. And then maybe I also want to do the Modicon Modbus suite. So I can selectively choose what I want to install as far as the drivers, or 
I can actually just do the full communication server. Entire feature will be installed on local hard drive. Everything turns white. Nothing is gray or X'd out, which means I'm going to install the full server. So uh, that might seem um, like too much, but it's actually a very small footprint on your hard drive. If you look down here, we have footprint information, and it's only 105 megs. Um, on your hard drive. So it's actually not that big of a footprint and that way I don't have to go through the hassle of installing something else later and coming back and installing a plugin or a driver um, if I find out I need that functionality later. So if I click next here and next through the next couple windows it's going to start the install. So the install is going to take a moment. Um, why that's installing I'm going to ask a couple poll questions. So I want to see who on the line is actually currently using Cat Server EX. So I'll launch this poll while, while we're installing here. And if you could answer, um, I want to get a sense of, you know, who's my audience? Are you currently using Cat Server EX or what's the deal? So go ahead and answer that. I'll leave it up for a few seconds. And that's okay if you're, you're unsure, you don't know, we have an option for that as well. So a couple more seconds. Looks like a lot of you are voting, so that's great. Okay, awesome. And I'll close that out. And let's share these results with you. So luckily it looks like we got a lot of Kept Server EX current users on the line. So wonderful to have you. Um, we love that you're engaging with us this way. Okay, uh, so I think the install is done. Yep. So I can click finish here. But I'm going to ask one more question before we get into the configuration. I want to know if you are using Cap Server X, which luckily the majority of you are, what is your experience configuring Cap Server X? So one could be no experience or maybe you're an expert. So let me know. One to five, five being an expert. What is your experience in actually configuring the server and um, being the server administrator? So I'm going to leave that up for a few more seconds. Thank you very much. If you go ahead and uh, select which radio button you want. Okay, wonderful. Looks like lots of people are voting, so get your votes in. I'm going to close this out in a few more seconds. Okay, great. So let's share this. It looks like a pretty even distribution. Uh, maybe a little bit of a bell curve with most of you considering yourself you know, moderate um, configuring the server. So that is great. All right, so let's get into the configuration of the server. So what do we mean by configuration? Well, when I installed, I got this little Caps of VX v5 configuration icon on my desktop. I'm going to double click on that. And this launches the configuration uh, window, which many of you are probably familiar with. So the first thing I see when I, on a clean install when I launch this configuration is a simulation project that we call simdemo.opf. And that is installed um, with the Caps of VX install. And so I can see I'm using the simulator driver. And if I launch something called my quick client here, I can connect and see that I'm actually getting data. Um, so that's my simulator driver just generating data in server cache, and I can see that changing here. So that just verifies that, hey, my server's working. I'm not actually connected to the device, but I can see simulated data coming through. So uh, it sounds like a simple rule of thumb or best practice, but when you first open up these projects, don't just start uh, creating channel device tag connections from here. Go ahead and create a new project, um, and we're going to save it with a new name. We're not, we don't want to save over that simdemo.opf. So I'll save that as webinar.opf, and we'll save that to my desktop. And now I have this OPF here. Um, this OPF, uh, the extension OPF, is our proprietary uh, extension for our project files. And it's all you need to send this project somewhere else and to load it on another server. So if I sent this out to someone after this webinar, you'd be able to open up the exact same project that I'm about to build. So now that I uh, create a new project, I'm going to click to add a channel. I'm going to give it a name, and today we're connecting to an Allen Bradley Control Logics controller. So enter a new channel name, and then select my device driver. 
and you see I have a long list of drivers here because I did the full install and I'm going to choose Allen Bradley Control Logics Ethernet. And I'm definitely going to want to uh, specifically, explicitly select my network adapter because I have multiple NICs on this computer. So that's another good rule of thumb. If you have multiple network adapters on the computer, be sure to not just leave this at default select here. Um, the reason is if you leave it at default, the bind order for those adapters will change when you restart the computer. And then Again, I'm taking a beginner's perspective here. Maybe I don't know what all these settings are in this wizard, but our default settings are meant to get you there in the first time. So I'm just going to click next through most of this, and then maybe I'll need to come back and tweak it later, and we'll see. So that's it for creating a channel. And then I'm going to obviously go ahead and create a device. But before that, um, I'm going to actually uh, have people uh, answer this. Um, what do you think a channel is? I explained it a little, but what is a channel? What am I doing when I create a channel in the server? So you can type in your questions pane or in the chat. What do you think a channel is? Any, any takers? Okay, I'm getting uh, some good answers here. Yeah, communication, a logical grouping, interface. Oh, bingo, someone got it. Uh, Thomas, Thomas got it. He said a communication path. Um, also, I got communication thread from Richard. Very, very good. So it looks like most of you got the concept. So a channel is a path of communications. It's how you're getting somewhere. And on the channel level, you typically specify your communication protocol, your driver, and your physical connection, um, which is typically serial or Ethernet. And it's a single thread of communications. Um, so what that means is the single thread can process commands and be managed independently of any other channel. And that's where we get into the concept of channel threading. So this thread can be thought of as a single lane highway. If you have uh, multiple cars on a single lane highway, they have to take turns. So that's where we get into the serial type of communication. Um, so two devices nested under this one channel, they have to take turns using that communications medium. Compare that to splitting devices out on multiple channels. They get their own dedicated thread, their own dedicated lane, and they can communicate in parallel. Uh, that's where you might have heard this term before, especially if you're used to working with CAT Server EX. Um, that's where we get the term or the phrase one channel per device. And that's one of our um, best practice recommendations, typically one channel per device. Because each channel would have its, it has its dedicated thread, so each device has its own uh, lane of communication to get data faster for higher throughput. You can actually have uh, multiple channels uh, pointed towards the same physical controller. So that's useful if you have a controller with a huge amount of tags in it. Um, for example, maybe I have 40,000 tags in my Allen Bradley controller. I could block out four separate channels and block out 10,000 tag groups each on each channel. Or maybe I have uh, critical tags on that channel that I want to read really fast, um, so I block them out on their own thread and then put all the other non-critical channels on another thread at a slower rate. Okay, so I'm going to ask a question, because obviously here it seems like the multi-channel, one channel per device recommendation is, is great, and you should always go with that, right? But I want to ask, what are some situations, or get you thinking, what are some situations where you would want um, uh, multiple devices under one channel, or that one channel per device, you don't want that. It's inappropriate to use one channel per device. So what are situations, and some people are actually asking this um, as a question, what are some situations where you don't want that communication working? So great, we got Patrick and Chris on a radio network, on a serial device. Really, really good answers here. John said serial communications. Um, ring type networks, so managing network bandwidth from Zach, so it looks like you guys got it. Great answers. So yeah, the reason that you want to nest devices under a channel is because you're using devices that are serial in nature, right? You have to use that serial methodology. Um, maybe you're working with limited bandwidth, a remote connection, a slow connection with lots of latency, you're going over a radio modem, um, or a slow wireless connection. Or maybe you only have a few items to be read. Those are the cases when nesting uh, multiple devices under one channel is actually the better practice. You're going to use that one channel per device rule if you have, obviously, devices that support Ethernet um, or that high-speed type of communication that aren't serial. 
Um, you got plenty of bandwidth and a high speed connection to play with, and maybe you have a big bulk of items to be read. So that's when you want to use the one channel per device rule of thumb. So your setup, I want you to keep in mind, is going to depend on your specific scenario. One channel per device is one of our best practices. It's a recommendation, but it's not a rule. So you need to consider your connection type, your device type, your protocol, and your process. There's no one size fits all solution. Great, so you guys definitely pass. I'm excited for you. I'm going to go ahead and ask another poll question. And I want to ask, will you modify your projects after learning about this? Or maybe this is, this is old news for you, so you're not actually going to uh, modify your projects. But will you modify your projects after learning that? So are you going to change your products to be one channel per device? Are you going to start using multiple channels to a single PLC to get data faster? Or are you going to actually start using multiple devices under one channel for serial? Or no, you're not going to change your project. So go ahead and answer that question. I'll leave that up for a few seconds. You can multi-select here. So getting some great answers. Thank you for voting. Leave it up for a few more seconds. Wonderful. OK. I'll close this. So some of you, about 50, half of you said no, but the other half of you said yes. You know, I am going to go back and, and reconsider how I'm changing my channel architecture. So that's great to see. OK. So now we cover channel, device. This is fairly easy, right? Device is your destination. It's the place you're going. So it's that specific control or that specific data source that you're getting to. On the device level, you're going to specify a device ID, which oftentimes includes an IP address if you're going over Ethernet, um, a model, and then you're going to have lots of custom options on the device level, like what protocol options you want to use. Are you going to use register blocking? And how are you going to get data from that specific controller? So we'll show this in our Allen Bradley example. So I'm going to click to add a device, leave it device one, or maybe I could change it to my specific controller name. I'm connecting to a 5500, which is the first one in my device model list, but you'll see that we have tons of models supported in our control logics Ethernet driver. Put in my IP and routing path for control logics. I have to put in a comma one, comma zero to target the backplane in the CPU slot location. And then again, maybe I'm a beginner, so the rest of these settings, I'm just going to leave it default. And our default settings are meant to get you there the first time. So respect client specified scan rate is fine with me. And I do want to point out, uh, well, first of all, I'm using the default TCP port. So that's the other thing you'd probably want to change if you've changed that. Um, we're using 44818. And then, for example, here, there's a lot Lots of custom options I have for um, the Control Logix controller. So if I click my Help button, this actually brings me directly to the Allen Bradley Control Logix Ethernet Help page and explains in detail what all of those options mean. So if you're ever in doubt and you do want to know what some of this means without just leaving it at default, then you can go into our Help and find it there and click it directly from this window. So I finish there, and if I want to get back and change any of those settings after the fact, I can get in, right click on the channel and go properties to get back into channel properties. For example, if I want to change my network card, or right click on the device and go into properties if I want to change any of those device properties. And you see, uh, compared to channel properties on the device level, I have a ton of customization options. So I can really fine tune how I'm getting data from that device. So the first thing, uh, or the thing, uh, two major things I want to show here. Um, first, I'm going to go into Logix database settings. And I have selected by default this create tag database from device. So that begs the question, well, what is a tag? Um, you probably already know that. But also, what do we mean when we say tag database or database? So I'll just pop up a real simple slide here. So a tag is a specific item reference. So you give um, KevServerX, you put in a tag name, which can be anything you want it to be, and then specifically an address to target the address space of the controller or of the data source you're trying to get to. And when we say database, we mean just you know, a grouping of those specific item references under a device when you create that in the server. Um, so a tag can be a data point or a data primitive 
typically refers to digital analog I.O. or register and memory location. And the tag database is just a group of those references. Fairly simple. So I'm going to create my tag database from my device, which means I'm actually going to go out to the controller. So the cap server is going to go out to the controller, walk uh, the controller program, and pull in all the items that were created by the PLC programmer in that controller. And so I have to go to my database creation tab. And this is where I see this auto create button pop up. So I'm going to click that. And as soon as I click that, I see these messages coming through my event log. So retrieving controller project. And then I see I actually am contacting the controller, and it gives me details. Um, my firmware revision, my serial number, so that's great. And then it tells me, oh, look, I generated 54,000 tags from that controller. And I see here I got a little plus button. I can expand that. So I generated um, anything under the global program there and then any other programs I had. Um, on that controller. So wonderful. And I'm going to click my quick client button here to connect to that controller. It's going to take a minute to update because giving the initial update for 50,000 tags um, takes a tiny bit of time here. And once that updates, I should be able to see data coming through. It's good quality data coming through from my controller. And I actually have this configured here to just um, do dead updates. So I'm going to write a 1 to this Boolean so I can read and write to the controller now. So I'm going to write a 1 to this start data updates Boolean. And that's just going to start um, a counter that will start updating for me, hopefully. There we go. Okay, so I see those updates coming through, and you see that I'm, I'm getting updates as the data changes, so that's great. All right, I want to point out something here. As soon as I connected that quick client, this little demo expires with the time popped up. It's actually a two-hour uh, demo timer that starts counting down as soon as I connected my quick client. Um, so demo mode. Now some of you may be familiar with this. This can be uh, fairly interesting, right? Because if you get into demo mode, in, as soon as this demo expires, your runtime is going to stop, which means you're going to stop getting data, your data collection is done. Now the reason my demo timer started is because if I look, go into the administration menu here and go into my license utility, and I view license details for this computer. I have nothing licensed on this computer. So this Allen Bradley Control Logics Ethernet driver I'm using, not licensed. And thus, when I tried to get data from it, my demo timer started. So let's talk about demo mode and um, what triggers it. So again, demo mode is something that um, you want to try to avoid if you're actually you know, running a production uh, server. And it's something that's triggered when a client connects. So that could be um, an HM, your HMI software, Wonder Iconics, uh, Ignition, OEE software. It connects and subscribes to an item referenced by an unlicensed driver. That triggers for the whole runtime. Even if you have licensed drivers running, if you have one driver in use that is unlicensed, it triggers that demo timer for the entire thing. Okay. Also, um, that can trigger if, say, you go to do an upgrade. You go to move from uh, Kept Server version 5.9 to version 5.16, and the upgrade is outside of your support contract. That will trigger demo timer. Um, also, maybe your system time is just incorrect. Maybe you rebooted the machine or it crashed, and now it's saying it's uh, 2001 instead of 2014. Uh, that could also trigger the demo timer. So once you get into demo mode, um, Again, your runtime will stop after that two-hour period um, until you stop referencing that unlicensed driver or roll back to um, that previous version that is under your support contract. So, if you have questions about that, what's uh, you know when does your support contract expire or anything like that, feel free to contact sales or technical support, and they can help you out with that. But just be aware of what's going to trigger you into uh, that demo mode because nobody wants their plant to stop after after that two hours runs out. Okay, so another one of our best practices is just very simple, 
use the driver help files. Um, this may seem trivial, um, but it is uh, very, very helpful to actually go in here and, and look around if you never have. Um, so I can access the help files through the, ins it'll, it'll be installed on my computer, and so I can access the help files through my programs menu, through my start menu here in help documentation. We have tons of help files here. So there I see Allen Bradley Control Logix Ethernet help. And I wanted to note that these files are updated every release by our developers and maintained by full-time tech writers, so they should be accurate. And note here that these um, files actually go beyond help for just our server software. They also include things like performance optimizations. So we have optimizing your communications, optimizing your application, performance tuning. So if we go into this performance tuning example, I see, oh, here's screenshots from RS Logix and talking about um, how it can format things in the controller program for um, optimization with the server. So lots of helpful tips and tricks there. So this is not just for um, Allen Bradley Control Logix, uh, our more uh, complicated drivers like BACnet or Omron Fins, th this type of optimization um, examples exist. Um, other thing, we, uh, communications routing for Allen Bradley, we have routing examples if you're using um, an Allen Bradley controller as a master controller and routing through to other devices off the back plane. So these help files, obviously, they can be um, accessed through the computer you have kept ReX installed on. Um, they can also be accessed if you're on our main page, kepware.com. You just go to Support, Support Center, and Manuals and Help Files. And all of the help files that you saw in that help file view are here uh, posted as PDFs as well. Uh, so other thing about that support center real quick, if you go back to support and go to our knowledge base, say you don't want to look through the help files, you just want to search for something, you can use something called our knowledge base search redundancy, and I say, oh, here's something, do all uh, drivers support media level redundancy, which is device failover, device redundancy, and there I go, I get a list of the drivers that support it. So lots of resources available online. Okay, so there's lots of stuff. It might be overwhelming. What if you just want uh, quick information about the specific drivers you have installed, what they're capable of, um, and you don't want to go digging through the help file for that information? I'm going to show you a quick shortcut to get that information. Okay. Okay, so pay attention here. I'm going to go help support information, and I see you know pretty typical information, what version I'm running, some contact info. But then I click this versions button down here, and lo and behold, I see all the installed components for my computer. So this is kind of cool because note, I can get a list of my installed components, and if I open up my license utility, I can see what I have licensed. So if you're wondering, oh, what do I have licensed versus what do I have installed? you can compare those two lists, right? So that's helpful. Other thing, if I actually click on one of these, I get the summary button that pops up, and it gives me a quick, uh, helpful hints breakdown of what that driver is capable of. So maximum number of supported channels, 256. Um, can it uh, auto-generate a tag database? Yes, it can. Uh, can it do device discovery? No, this one doesn't support it. Um, then if I scroll down further, it actually gives me information for each model um, that, of controller that we support through that driver. Um, and then helpful hints down here on how to address um, items going out to that controller, how to address your tag references. So let's do one more in here. Maybe we'll do, um, we'll go to the ends. We'll do Modbus. So there we see 256 channels supported and what the com serials default settings are. So lots of helpful information you can find that way. And then, of course, um, addressing hints if you go down further. Okay, wonderful. Well, we've covered a lot of ground so far. And uh, now that I'm well on my way, I've created my projects, um, I've started exploring help files, I've created a channel and I'm getting data from my device, uh, let's talk about a helpful feature um, that's a little more advanced that we call Ethernet encapsulation. So this is a case where maybe I have you know, some devices out on my line, on my plant floor, um, they use serial connections, right? And I don't, I'm not close enough to them or I don't have a long enough serial cable to actually go out and get data from them. So a common thing I might use in that scenario is a serial to Ethernet converter. 
And that way I can use the Ethernet connection from my computer and actually um, get out to that serial device, leveraging that powerful Ethernet connection. So that might be a common scenario for you. Um, I want to know, does anybody on the line use Ethernet capsulation, encapsulation already or actually know what it is? So I'm going to launch that poll question. So go ahead, simple yes or no, do you use Ethernet encapsulation or know what it is, or no you don't. And I'll leave that open for a few seconds. So thanks for voting. Do you use Ethernet encapsulation or know what it is, yes or no? All right, got quite a few voted. I'll leave it open for a few seconds longer. Yes or no, do you use Ethernet encapsulation? Again, that's where you're using uh, maybe an Ethernet, serial Ethernet converter to get out to a serial device. Okay, great, thanks for voting. I'll share those results. So it looks like a um, fairly even split, but the no's have it. The majority of you um, do not use it. So great to know. So this might be helpful for those of you who um, don't use it or don't know what it is or have those serial devices that you're trying to get out to. So uh, Ethernet encapsulation is available for certain serial drivers. So for example, our Modbus RTU serial driver. I can use, instead of going through that serial COM port, and I can configure my communication channel to use this Ethernet encapsulation mode. Um, so the best practice here is that in this Ethernet encapsulation scenario, you're going to be using those serial to Ethernet converters. And when you use those, those are often packaged with um, virtual COM port software or software that um, can make it look to your computer like a serial port and, and do that um, handling for you. And our recommendation is to not use that. So you're actually going to want to use raw TCP or pass-through mode for those serial to Ethernet converters and then use our Ethernet encapsulation option and just let us do the work. You get a couple cool advantages of, from that. One, we're able to optimize your communication because it's all within Capsular Reacts. And two, you can use communication diagnostics to see the, ethern, uh, the Ethernet traffic going through um, the server. And we'll get into communication diagnostics in a little bit. But those are two major advantages that you wouldn't get if you didn't use that raw TCP or pass-through mode. So I'm just going to show you on the server. I'll go ahead and create um, a Modbus serial channel here. So in this case, I'm going to use Modbus R2 serial. And here under connection type, you can see I can either um, target a COM port, that physical port, or I can use Ethernet encapsulation and go over um, a specific uh, network card. So that allows me, and then, you know, click through all the default settings for the device. I'm not going to actually target a real device here. And now I'm ready to communicate over Ethernet encapsulation, using Ethernet encapsulation to that serial device. Okay. So we've done a lot here. Um, we've configured a couple channels. And say we're ready to get data. My project's ready to go. And I'm going to, again, launch that quick client. So we launched the quick client before. And luckily, I already built all these tags here. And I can see that I'm getting some data. So that's great. So what is my quick client? This is actually a separate software application that is installed with the server. So it's not a part of Cap Server EX. You can launch it from the server, and when you launch it from the server like I just did, it automatically builds um, this project here and automatically creates a subscription of the server. So now I see clients uh, active two and a ton of active tags. Those 54,000 tags I have in my controller are active because I'm actively subscribed to them. Um, this quick client can just real help uh, real quickly help you test out device connectivity. And you can also launch it from our administration menu down here. So the quick client has a couple cool things. It exposes system tags to you. You can get these system tags in any uh, HMI or client that you have connected, such as active tag count, how many clients are connected, 
um, the date and time info for the computer the server's installed on. If I go to the channel level system tags, I see you know, which network adapter I'm using. And then on the device level system tags, I can see, oh, you know, an error tag, is my device an error? And what it does. So I'm just going to go ahead and launch the quick client from my admin menu and connect to a server. So again, I went down here, right clicked, launched my quick client. This quick client can actually connect to um, other OPC servers, not just CAP Server X, but I'm going to connect to CAP Server X again. I'm going to add a group, and then I'm going to go ahead and add items to this group, and I can browse my server for different items. So I'm going to pull um, in some of those Allen Bradley Control Logics tags. And I just want to show here that if I um, right-click on these, you might have seen this when I was doing the configuration for the controller in the beginning of the webinar, I can do synchronous reads and writes and asynchronous reads and writes. And I was doing some asynchronous writes um, to this tag previously. So I have some stuff going on there. And that kind of begs the question, what is synchronous and asynchronous, and are there any recommendations we have for how to configure a client? So this synchronous and asynchronous reads and writes, that's a feature of OPC DA, a part of the OPC DA specification. And any OPC DA compliant um, application is going to have an option um, or should you know, have an option for configuring your client to use asynchronous or synchronous reads and writes. So what are asynchronous and synchronous, and what do um, we recommend? So let me just show you this in an animation. Um, we have a client in the server here, and if I'm doing a synchronous type of communication, I have to send a da data request and wait for a response from the server for that data request before I can go on and request data item number two and item number three and so on. So we call that a blocking call, which means that I have to wait for the server to respond to my first data request before I can go on and request anything else. Um, the issue here, you can kind of see why this is an inefficient right off the bat. Maybe I have a device that takes a long time to respond, and I have to wait for the device to get back and the server to get back to me before I can get any other data. The other thing is maybe that device is in error or is disconnected, so I have to wait for a nine-second timeout to go on and get other um, information or, or maybe another timeout if you've changed your settings. So in asynchronous mode, it's a little more efficient. The client can go ahead, request um, all the data it wants, boom, 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 boom. And then the server is going to return that data in what's called data callbacks. And it can return those uh, data callbacks. Um, it, it doesn't need to return them in order. So maybe it returns um, data callback through first. It's just as that data comes in. So you can immediately see how that's more efficient um, than the serial mode. The client can go ahead and request all it wants, and then the server can return data and data callbacks. So our best practice here, our general rule of thumb, is use those asynchronous modes when you're configuring your client for communication with the server. Okay, great. So um, that is it for talking about you know, the configuration and client connections. We've covered a lot of ground now, but I want to get into something that we call the four services. Um, or that you could call the four services. So when you install CatServerX, if I just get into my um, task manager here, there's these four services, four executables I have running, right? So admin, config, event log, and runtime. And you see that uh, runtime and event log, they're running a system, which means nobody has to be logged into the computer for me to get data and for my runtime to keep going. And they'll hopefully restart if the computer goes through a reboot, right? That's great. And also, my runtime is isolated, right? It's isolated from these other processes because who wants to stop their plan operations to just add a new device connection? or to add a new user or password to the user manager. You don't, right? So you can interact with these other processes and let the runtime keep going, keep getting your data. And so that, that answers the question, why four separate services? So let's explore the services a little bit more, what they do, what they are. So we have our administration here. And you right click on that little item in your uh, task tray in the lower right hand corner to get to your administration menu. So this has your license utility. You can launch the quick client from here. OPC UA configuration. If you get into settings, you can configure your user manager, configure how you store your event logs and diagnostic logs. And then you can do things like start and stop the runtime process. In your config, uh, so 
so administration application level settings. In your config, that's project level settings. So in your config, you can do things like create device connections. Um, you can go into file project properties and configure your client interfaces. You can configure plugins from this drop-down menu. So your configuration, much like PLC programming software, can be connected or disconnected online or offline with the PLC. Your configuration can be connected or disconnected from the runtime. So you can be connected to the runtime, actively editing your runtime project, or disconnected from your runtime in offline mode, editing your project in offline mode. And I'll explain how that works in a little bit. Next service, we have our event log. Pretty straightforward here. It just shows us some information, you know, what drivers I have starting up here. It might show something like a DNR, a device not responding message. I showed you the um, messages that came through when I was auto generating a tag database. So helpful information there. Process in FIFO order, and you can view that in the bottom um, half of your configuration window. And then your runtime. And notice there's, there's nothing I can show you, uh, no screenshot I can show you for the runtime. All I have here is the Windows Task Manager showing that the server runtime is indeed uh, launched and running. That's, why, that's because uh, the runtime is headless, and that's for a very specific reason, um, because we, we want to encapsulate the runtime and keep it in its own little bubble, doing the work, gathering the data, maintaining those client connections without anybody um, bothering it. So it's actually running off default.opf. Uh, it's this project file located in the program directory, and that's how it's able to be isolated. So it's not, you know, I created webinar.opf at the beginning of this webinar. It's not running off webinar.opf. It's running off default.opf, and that's how I'm able to get that um, behavior where I can connect the configuration and also edit a project offline. So here's the four services grouped together. Let's look a little bit how they interact. So the administration can interact with runtime, start and stop it. Um, passes licensing info, maybe triggers the runtime to go into demo mode. Um, the configuration can be connected to the runtime to dynamically edit that default.opf and also connected to get the event log information. And then the runtime is probably sending event and error info to that event log. So what happens when I go into what's called offline mode? Well, I take my config into offline mode, and that's where I can edit my project, webinar.opf, in offline mode. So I'm not actually connected to default.opf anymore. I'm just editing my offline project. And then as soon as I connect my config to the runtime, that webinar.opf gets pushed into default.opf, gets renamed and pushed into default.opf. So I'll show you that again. I'm connecting my config back to my runtime after being in offline mode and I push my project into default.opf. So that's how the offline mode works, and I can demo this here for you. So here I am, I, I'm connected, and I can tell that because at the bottom right hand of my configuration window here, I see I'm logged in as default user. I have one client connected with six active tasks. So if I go runtime, disconnect, now I see I'm in offline mode. So I'm still getting data. I can still see good data coming through my client. My runtime is still going. Launch my task manager. I still see the runtime there. But my config is offline. So any edits I make in here, say I create a new simulator channel, and just real quick, I'm going to fly through this and add a tag. I'll make a ramp simulator tag here. If you want hints on addressing, you can press that little blue hint button there. So I'll create a ramp. OK. So I've created that. I've edited my offline project. I can save that to webinar.opf. Right, so it's saved off. But if I go into my quick client again and right click here and go auto create tags, I won't see that simulator driver pop up. And I'll take a minute again because of the large amount of items I have in my Allen Bradley controller. So I'm still offline, but my runtime should still be going. And I've auto-created here. So I see Allen Bradley. I see my bus. I see that group zero I created before. But I don't see um, my simulator uh, available. And if I added an item, went to browse um, to add an item here, I wouldn't see the simulator pop up because I haven't pushed my edits into default.opf. So if I go runtime connect, it says update the runtime with the loaded project following connect. So if I click yes, I'm taking webinar.opf and pushing it into default.opf. 
notice that this is going to disconnect any clients connected. So when I do that, when I go from offline to online mode and update the runtime project, I will disconnect my clients. They'll have an opportunity to reconnect very shortly, but I will disconnect them. So I'm just going to delete the majority of these groups so that we can connect quickly. So I'm going to right click and go connect again. And then if I add items here again, I can see, oh, there's my simulator coming through. I can add the ramp tag. And there's my ramp coming through. So I updated that runtime project. So some of you may, uh, may be wondering, you know, why, um, why would you want to update in offline mode? Why don't you always uh, be connected? It is safe to be connected and just, you know, I can copy paste here and make, new, um, make a new channel by just copy pasting with the same setup and access that immediately. Since I'm dynamically editing the runtime, I can access that immediately from my item list here. So now that's available as well. So I have the two duplicate run, uh, ramps running. So I can safely edit this project while I'm dynamically connected to the runtime. Um, the reason you might want to go in offline mode is um, maybe you want to experiment with another project. Um, maybe you want to um, edit some things. If I have a client subscribed, I can't edit things here. Like maybe if I go try to edit this tag name, um, my runtime won't let me because I have the quick client connected to it and reading it. So I might need to go into offline mode to do those sorts of edits, right? Um, just keep in mind when you go into offline mode and then back connect to the runtime, you will do that disconnect of your clients briefly. Okay, so what starts and stops the runtime? Also important to kind of understand um, what starts and stops the runtime so that um, you know what you're doing when you're going in and editing things, right? So starts the runtime. When you launch the configuration window, that'll start it if it's not started yet. But note that disconnecting or closing the configuration, that doesn't do anything. Um, same thing if a client connects, a quick client connects, an HMI connects. If it's not started yet, it will start. Disconnecting that client does nothing. So um, if you go select Start Runtime Service from the admin menu, that'll start it. This is what's going to stop it if you do explicitly stop Runtime Service, right? So that's pretty straightforward. And then the other thing that's going to stop it is upgrading or installing a new product. When you are dynamically connected, adding a channel, device, or tag, that shouldn't stop your runtime. And again, this is, this is the, main, the best way here to stop your Runtime Service if you need to. Right-click through the admin menu, stop it through the admin menu. Don't go into your you know, task manager and shut it down from there. Okay, so now that we've covered a lot, we had a few questions for the people that are using CAPS Every X on the line. Um, if you're not using CAPS Every X or you are using it but not um, you know, all the drivers available, I want to know, are you interested in using it in your uh, environment? So I'll launch that poll question for you. Are you interested in using any of this in your environment? So go ahead, I'll leave that open for a few seconds. So yes, you are interested, you're unsure, you don't know, you don't know or no, you're not. So I'll leave that open for a few more seconds. Okay, great. I'm closing that poll. And wonderful. It looks like a lot of you are interested in using some of this functionality, so that's great to see. Okay, so I'm going to breeze through um, the rest of these topics because we're running short on time and I want to make sure I get you out of here at the hour if you need to leave. We will be available after the hour is up uh, for Q&A. So diagnostic tools. Um, we already went over a couple things that you can use to diagnose and debug things, the quick line and the event log. Then we have communication diagnostics and OPC diagnostics for you. I don't have time to go through over those in depth, but I did include these helpful resources, and you'll be getting this presentation at the end of this uh, uh, webinar. So you can look at communication diagnostics or OPC diagnostics, how to enable those, how to start capturing. And the best practice here is um, how to use those diagnostics to benchmark the performance of your projects. So benchmark, how quickly does it get you, uh, take you to get data back? And the reason you'd want to do a benchmark is so if you go on, you modify your project later, you add channel device tag, um, something changes, your network changes, you can see how was my performance before compared to how I'm doing now. 
DCOM. So DCOM is a sticky issue. You have to use it. It's a Microsoft um, protocol you have to use for remote communication. So if you have your HMI software installed on a separate computer from your server. Um, in our help documentation, uh, first of all, we get this question all the time through tech support. Um, so you can call them and they'll, they'll help you out. But we also have in uh, the documentation a remote OPC VA quit start guide if you are doing that remote com connectivity and need to um, mess around with DCOM. And we have a lot of resources available online too. Okay, upgrades. Um, first thing you want to do before you upgrade, ensure your licensing is valid for that version. Call sales, call tech support, make sure your license covers that version. You can uh, purchase support, it's very inexpensive, and it'll give you free upgrades for a year. Um, then you go ahead and download the most recent version, and make sure before you go through the install, you save a copy of your OPF to disk. Save it to a thumb drive, save it to a network drive so you have it um, after, uh, in case the install goes awry. And then you're going to disconnect all your clients and stop the runtime. And then you're ready to do that install, do the upgrade. If all you're doing is licensing a new product, you can do that through a licensing utility. Um, I do want to point out, so manage software license and you can activate a product that way. I do want to point out that when you go through the licensing process, you want to stop your runtime service and start it again to get that to take effect. Okay, the application report. So last subject of the day today. Um, you want to know number one way you can speed up your issue resolution if you have to engage technical support. Generate this application report right off the bat and send it with your initial request. It contains a wealth of information that will help them quickly get to the root of your issue. It contains your event log, your OPF, your licensing, your operating system information. You know, it saves you the trouble of taking tons of screenshots and typing up complicated descriptions of your problem if you just send us that application report immediately. Um, you do that through Start All Programs. Um, so if I go Start All Programs, Kepware, KepServeX, it's located in the Utilities folder. I'm not going to go through that now because it's actually changing quite a bit in version 5.16. If you're interested in learning about the application report and getting more details on that, I will go over it in our 5.16 public webinar, uh, which is on November 4th. And 5.16, version 5.16, releases on October 21st, so it will be available then. Okay, you guys, you, we have been through thick and thin together. I have to say, I was mortified at the having the computer crash the first time that's happened to me, but thank you so much for staying on the line and staying with me. You guys are my guys. Um, we covered from installation, configuration, channel device tag, uh, the four services, um, the application report, upgrading. We covered a lot of ground, so I want to know, of course, I close out with a poll question. If you haven't noticed yet, I like these. Um, so what topics did you find the most helpful today? Um, was it the configuration, the driver help and optimization information, quick client, client connectivity, license and upgrading, those diagnostic tools? What did you find the most helpful? So I'll leave that up for a few seconds. And then I actually have one more after that. Okay, so yep, looks like a lot of you found the configuration helpful, so that's wonderful. Leave that up for a few more seconds. Which did you find the most helpful? Okay, so I'll close that and share that with you. Looks like a lot of found um, the configuration information helpful and then also diagnostic tools, so that's great. Uh, so next question, what topics would you like to learn more about? So is there anything that we covered, you know, we covered a lot of things, you know, briefly here. You know, what should the subject of our next webinar be, or um, what do you want to learn more about? What are you interested in getting a deeper dive on? So go ahead. What are you interested in learning more about? And if you want to type any suggestions into the questions pane in the chat window, feel free to do that. So we'll leave that up for a few more seconds. Thank you so much for voting. Okay. So, looks like pretty much the same spread as what you found the most useful. So, great info. Thank you guys very much. So, best practices. Intelligent installations and upgrades. 
One channel device, good recommendation for high throughput, but not a blanket rule. Uh, use that optimization information that's located in driver help files. The raw TCP mode for serial to Ethernet converters. Asynchronous requests from your clients. Understand what those first services are and how they interact and what's going to stop your runtime or start it. Use diagnostic tools for benchmarking and perform those regular backups with the application report. Oh, that's one other thing I didn't really go over, but the application report, great tool for backing up your project. And send that to tech support right off the bat. Okay, so that's the summary. You guys were amazing. You can contact me directly at training at Kepler.com. Um, sales and technical support always available. Uh, if you want more information on training, you can fill out that training request form. You can follow us on LinkedIn, our Kepler product training page, and as always, go to the YouTube page for more of these videos. So we are on the hour. That was long. Um, I will stay on the line, and so will my other application engineers here to answer questions. Um, but if you want to log off at this point, you can, so thank you very much.